I've been uh, in, an initiate uh, in Freemasonry for 30 years. I mean, mm. this is something that not many people have been. I don't practice yeah. any longer Freemasonry, so I'm kind of like... Uh, right. Because uh, when I came here to the U.S., I went through a few lodges here in California and understood the kind of connotation they had, the, the fact yeah. that they were very much politically leftist inclining, but also they were accepting. Some of them, no, eh? there is some lodges who are more conservative. Yeah. Most of them were actually already branding me because of my association with, uh, you know, with Alex Jones, with other people. They were already seeing, ah, this is real Zagami. No. You know? And, and, and it, it, I didn't like that. Yeah. And, I, and I didn't like also the fact right. that they, here in California especially, most of the lodges are infiltrated by the OTO, OTO which is the Ordo Tempi Orientis of Alistair Crowley, that became of Alistair yeah. Crowley was born out of the Illuminati of Germany and Austria. Then you have uh, infil- mm-hmm. uh, people who have infiltrated from even the Muslim Brotherhood and other groups. So I just didn't feel wow. right, especially when they said that the former a former grandmaster had criticized publicly Donald Trump. I said, well, screw them. I'm not into this. Yeah. Welcome to Far Out with Faust, everybody. I am Faust Chicho, and today I am excited and delighted to be joined by Leo Zagami. Uh, Let me tell you about this incredible guy and what he's been up to. He is a writer and a researcher. His grandfather was Senator Leopoldo Zagami. He's a Sicilian politician who is also a historian and an author. He married into the aristocratic family of Marquis de Gregorio. Leo's mother, Jessica Lyon Young, is a member of the family of the Queen Mother of England. And her father, Henry Lyon Young, was also a writer. And why am I telling you all this? Stick around, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share that as well. Leo, a.k.a. Young, is well-known. He was well-known and renowned in the media and music industry as a record producer, but he gained global notoriety in 2006 because of his direct involvement and knowledge of the New World Order and secret societies that we often refer to as Illuminati. His writings rose to international attention and gained uh, such attention from people like David Icke, who you guys know from my show, um, because it contained accurate and evidence-backed inside information. Now, between 2009 and 2013, Leo began publishing books in Europe and Japan based on a wide variety of subjects. I've gotten into a few of them, They are incredible, Um, and they range from the history of secret societies in the Vatican to geopolitical matters concerning the New World Order. He's contributed on a number of books dedicated to exposing the secret world of Vatican Freemasonry, and uh, his his work is just incredible. Um, We're going to get into it, and uh, you guys are going to have a lot a lot to go on um, if you're interested in this kind of work. Leo, thank you so much for beaming in, brother. It's an honor to have you on the show. A pleasure. Uh, far out with the Faust. Uh, I hope you haven't done a Faustian <laughs> pact of some kind. But uh, we are here to <laughs> I get course, that a lot. Uh, talk about all those who did. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So I, we are indeed. I guess you have a lot of questions. Uh, we spoke. Uh, before starting the show about oh, I do. the so, books uh, you know, uh, of mine. So, I mean, I guess you are well versed into my work. <laughs> I, I am. Um, and so first let me say that, I, you know, it takes tremendous courage and a big heart to do what you're doing and what you've been doing. You know, it's uh, it's not an easy road to come out and speak about these things, especially when you were so involved. And so I just want to tip my hat to you, my friend, and, and say that right off the bat. Um, nice. Utmost respect nice. for you and, and, and what you've done with your life. Absolutely. It's not an easy option to make that choice. And I guess that uh, it's still not an easy option, but at least during the last 20 years, uh, in some way, I managed to uh, awake some people to the reality of what really goes on, goes on behind the scenes. Indeed. 
Indeed. I can't even imagine. Um, you know, but so, so much to, to talk about, you know, I thought we would start with, because I've never had anyone on the show who's so well versed and familiar with, with kind of this part of history, this part of the world and, uh, and what's gone on there, which is, you know, pretty unbelievable for a lot of people, particularly Americans who tend to be, uh, on, uh, in general on the naive side <laughs> about what's happening with the Catholic church and with the Vatican and with some of these, uh, secret societies, you know, but I, I thought we would start with, um, the Jesuits, because I know I have questions. Um, and I know you spoke about this extensively in, in more than one of your books. Um, and I haven't got a chance to read all of them yet, but you know, my question is, how did the Jesuits go from being something um, that was outside of the Catholic Church, you know, to something that I think w could be considered uh, a nemesis and a rival of the Catholic Church and the Vatican specifically, to to the point where we are today, where it is kind of totally infiltrated and almost taken over to a large degree the Vatican and and the the, the Catholic Church hierarchy. First of all, uh, thank you again for having me on and for uh, being able to discuss uh, also topics that are uh, kind of uh, demanding for most people uh, that, of course, don't have an idea, like you said, of what really goes on, especially in the Catholic Church these days. It's not really correct to say, mm -hmm. though, that the Jesuits uh, um, were external. Of, they were external to the Catholic okay. Church probably for six years. That was between 1534 when they kind of uh, put together this group of friends, this idea uh, in the University of Paris. And then they managed to get this idea accepted in 1540 because we were uh, at the beginning of that uh, uh, delicate phase, which was uh, the Reformation, and so the Catholic Church wanted mm. to go on the offensive with the Counter-Reformation. And they didn't really have, uh, since the demise of the Knights Templars, a military uh, uh, religious order uh, that uh, could fight the enemy of the Church in the same way. And, of course, uh, uh, they chose for this uh, mission somebody who had a very, uh, not a very clean past. I mean, he had been arrested five times by, uh, by the Inquisition before uh, really getting uh, his order uh, accepted. And uh, in 1540, it was sanctioned basically by papal decree. But before arriving to the papal decree, he, uh, with his group of friends in Paris, uh, uh, had uh, seen uh, what was going on. I mean, uh, he had been also for a period in a college where uh, Calvin, who of course is the guy who created Calvinism, uh, was present. Mm -hmm. So Protestantism was uh, rampant, uh, was kind of uh, uh, very popular and it was gaining momentum. And they had destroyed the statue of the Holy Mary, which also in a way uh, turned him... Uh, to, uh, to find these uh, friends and say, we need to defend the church and we need to do it with the foundation of a new order. But before all this, he had, um, in 1521, he was uh, uh, still a, uh, a knight, a knight and a guy who came from an aristocratic family who was uh, injured in battle in Pamplona. And he was injured in battle, in, uh, and at that point uh, he uh, went for a period to a monastery, a Benedictine monastery, which is a beautiful monastery in, in northern Spain called uh, Montserrat. And uh, basically there mm. there is a statue of the Holy Mary of Montserrat, uh, which is a Black Mary. The traditions of the Black Mary goes back uh, to Isis because uh, uh, the Catholic Church kind of built up uh, this worship of the Black Mary on the old worship places of Isis. And uh, um, he, uh, well, 
he kind of had, uh, you know, like a religious moment, gave up his sword, gave up mm -hmm. his uh, military self to the Holy Mary, he gave up his sword, he, he left his sword in front of the statue, and uh, he gave himself to religious life. Uh, and at that point, uh, mm. he was supposed to go back to Barcelona, but on the way, he found another holy place where he stopped in this uh, uh, cave, uh, where he also started to devise what would become the foundation ground of the spirituality of his order, known as the spiritual exercises of uh, uh, Ignazio Loyola. And uh, it was at that point oh, nice, that... Yeah. Uh, he created the, let's say, the spiritual basis. Then he picked up a, a mule, uh, he put all his books, and he went to Paris, and then the rest is history, basically. Creating, though, an order from scratch meant also he had to inspire himself to mm. somebody. And uh, he took the inspiration uh, from uh, two religious orders. One was the Knights Templars, who, of course, didn't exist anymore. So he... When he went to the Pope, he proposed this uh, new order, also uh, knowing very well that the, uh, the fact that this, the Templars didn't exist had left a vacuum in the Church. And the Dominicans, mm. who had taken the, the place uh, of the Temple, like uh, with the Inquisition and everything, uh, were not as mm -hmm. successful in stopping uh, this uh, Protestantism, this Reformation. Why? Because... The, mm -hmm. uh, the Dominicans had been well known for having uh, their Inquisition uh, tribunals in the most harsh way and repressive way. And that didn't really make the people want to go back to the church, rather the opposite. Instead, the <laughs> Jesuits, right. to be more subtle, wanted to become like the secret agents of the church, wanted to transform and infiltrate every single branch of society, mm. which is what they did. Uh, that was the period, the initial period of uh, uh, Ignacio Loyola was actually filled by him and many uh, collaborators of him who believed in the idea that the church also had to retrieve occult knowledge from the East and for that reason go to China, mm. India. So the first missions of the Jesuits were actually in Asia. And it was in Asia that they expanded wow. the order and found all the success, mostly because uh, uh, they invested in, uh, in, in Japan, in the port of Nagasaki, which was a, just a small uh, fisherman port and transformed it uh, in a big port yeah. like Macau. Their basis initially, though, was Macau. Macau was a Portuguese colony. Now it's Chinese. Ah. Of course. Now it's the place where uh, all the Chinese go and and play it's like the las vegas of china but back and gamble then, and back then yeah. it wasn't a gamble place back then it was a, a uh, outpost of the portuguese it was a colony of the portuguese and the uh, chinese mm. wouldn't uh, let anybody inside china because they also didn't know chinese and they were forbidden from entering so mm. the jesuits first attempt to enter china didn't really go very well um and uh, Francesco Saverio, who basically was uh, the guy, the Francis, the Saint Francis Xavier, who expired the name of Saint Fra of Pope Francis, it's, uh, because people think when they see ah. the name of Francis, he inspired himself from Francis of Assisi. That is actually uh, the more. Uh, it, it's just uh, you know to feed the masses with uh, with a false myth. In reality, he based himself on. Mm -hmm. On, on a saint, which was a Jesuit saint, and one of the co-founders of the order, whose first mission was to go to Asia. Wow. And uh, uh, he eventually died in the outskirts, I think, in the island of Sakshan. I don't know if you pronounce it Sakshan. But in the outskirts of China, not yet mm. able to enter China. The idea was this. In Macau, we um, shape uh, together... Um, a college with uh, people who learn Chinese and then we get them to enter China. But the first guy to actually enter China and have a certain degree of success and being able to then, within the matter of a few years, reach the highest levels of the Chinese society and the emperor was Matteo Ricci. Mm. Matteo Ricci entered uh, China and then, uh, uh, of course, uh, 
um, the, 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 he, he forged an alliance uh, with the Confucian side. He wasn't able to forge an alliance with mm. the Buddhists. And in fact, he went on the offensive with the Buddhists and started to criticize the Buddhists and mm. the Buddhists started to criticize him. But at the beginning, they pretend to be Buddhist monks. The thing is that the, the, the Jesuits mm. were very much camouflaging uh, themselves. And they actually became yeah. lamas in Tibet and were basically welcoming the Buddhist monastery in Tibet. So they had also an experience. That's soon after the arrival in China. There was also wow. the arrival in Tibet of the uh, Jesuits. And at the same time, they started also to spread through India from Goa. Goa was another important place uh, for the Jesuits and for uh, the Jesuits uh, to be able to then, uh, in, in a way, spread their tentacles all over Asia, which was the first place they, place they really colonized. And then later on, another place which was of great importance for the Jesuit order, let's not forget, uh, is still to this day South and Central America, where they, of course, mm -hmm. uh, together with the Portuguese and the Spanish monarchies, took all the gold possible and imaginable uh, and yeah. uh, conducted themselves uh, in a way that uh, was, of course, uh, uh, depicted also in that film, I think, uh, Mission, no? Uh, was that film, uh, I think, with Robert oh. De Niro. There, there was a, a film uh, from, from a few years ago. It was a quite popular film. And that depicts that uh, period... Uh, uh, quite well. Uh, I think it's from 1986. Yes. 1986. And in fact, uh, that I forget film, the name, but I, we'll find it. Yeah. The film is called The Mission, and it's a 1986 a British period drama about the experience of a Jesuit missionary in 18th century South America, which I definitely advise everybody to watch because they will have a more clear idea of what we're talking about. Uh, many films are okay. touched. Uh, uh, there is also a more recent film, but I don't remember the name, that touched also on the Jesuits' mission in Japan uh, and, and, and what happened over there. At times they were welcome, but when the, from time to time uh, the monarchies or the people in charge of the country simply understood that what they were really doing, they were kicked out of those countries. They were kicked out of... of of a lot of countries. A, one a lot of places, right? Yeah. Yes. In fact, in the 1770s, they were kicked out even out of the Vatican. But that is a period... That yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. yeah but, but that was a brief period. It lasted between 1770 <laughs> to 1815, more or less, until the, the death, really, oh, okay. uh, of Napoleon uh, uh, sanctioned uh, a turning point. Mm. Also, because let's not forget that they were definitely also behind the Napoleon. Uh, the, the, the Napoleon mm -hmm. calls himself oh, yeah. a member of secret societies. As we know, he died in 1821, uh, poisoned probably, but uh, after a two yeah. uh, life uh, in which uh, he had already escaped another island. Uh, in Italy, he had already uh, reconquered France uh, in a few days, uh, and he had demonstrated that uh, France more or less was Napoleonic and, and wanted him there, but uh, yes. the New World Order back then decided that it was better to take him out of the picture because he... That's right, that's how he got poisoned. <laughs> yes, yeah. and, but he also he was very powerful, but he had also this uh, um, initiation that he had received from Count Cagliostro, who was one of the heads of the Illuminati. So he, he was actually very knowledgeable. And for that reason, he conducted expeditions that went all the way to Egypt. And it was during the Napoleonic mm. uh, period that we had the discovery of the Rosetta Stone that uh, influenced so much later the the whole unfolding of, uh, of, of understanding these hieroglyphs that up until then were never really fully mm -hmm. understood, if not by the Jesuits themselves. Because there was a guy called Athanasius mm -hmm. Kircher that uh, uh, was also very influential within the Jesuit movement. There is two Jesuits who influenced the, 
the Jesuit movement more than anybody else. One is Athanasius Kircher in the 17th century, and then the other one, of course, uh, more recent one, Pierre Teilhard de Cardin, who died in the 50s, who was very influential uh, uh, on, on many different uh, levels because he inspired, uh, he, I mean, he inspired the Exorcist movie he, character, the main character in the Exorcist, he inspired 2001 Space Odyssey uh-huh. because after C. Clark, like I explained in volume 6.66, uh, this is something I explain about yeah. the, the Pierre Telarque de Cardin figure. But Pierre de Telarque de Cardin is such an influential figure that I also had to continue and fold this influence also in volume seven. So just to explain. Uh, while instead, if people want yeah. to uh, become a bit more knowledgeable about Athanasius Kircher, I would suggest volume three of my confessions. As you know, I wrote... Volume uh, three. Uh, eight volumes of my confessions. On top of that, I also wrote another book called Invisible Master and another one called uh, Pope Francis, The Last Pope, uh, question mark, which is also been a bestseller. And I would suggest uh, <laughs> yeah. that everybody reads these books to then uh, dig much deeper into what we are discussing today, because what we are discussing today will be... Uh, considered superficial uh, by the expert uh, yeah. maybe who wants to know a little bit more, but you can't really go into 500, uh, 600 no, you can't fit it. pages it's... and then fit every bo- everything in an hour. It's too... <laughs> Impossible. So, no, it's too much. It's too much. You know, I, I'm, uh, I'm, 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 I, I picked up volume uh, 6.66 and yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm about 70% through it. And I, and I have, I have more questions now than I did before I started reading it. And I, so I'm, I'm anxious to, to go back and read the first volumes and also forward to read volume seven and, and your latest book. So, but the, the book contains such exquisite detail. You, you, if you're interested in everything that we're talking about, you're just, you're going to have to, you're going to have to pick up well, the books I mean, because uh, they're, they're, they're yeah. remarkable. They're well-written. They're easy to read. No, but also they, what I try to do in my books, I try to give a book that doesn't turn old after a year that you read. I mean, the volume 6.66 was published in early 2019. And I mean, I have it here behind me. Mm-hmm. show you. In early 2019, the symbol is the symbol of the world. Mm-hmm. Organization. There was no pandemic, but mm. uh, just to give you an right. idea, uh, the book opens uh, with a citation also from Elon Musk, who is worried about the artificial intelligence, just like he's worried right now. There has been just recently an open letter about uh, maybe pausing the development of uh, things like chat GPT uh, because of the danger they might implement. But uh, in this book, as you know, this danger is well, is already been denounced. Just as I y- yes. uh, predicted, uh, this book, Volume 7, comes out in February, early February 2022, already telling you about mm-hmm. the war in Ukraine that wasn't even started, mm. the Sino-Russian alliance with China, the possi- then the invasion of mm-hmm. Taiwan and everything that uh, means uh, this alliance between China and Russia. And back then, everybody was still hoping that mm-hmm. oh, Russia would come on board and, and oppose, uh, uh, sorry, China will oppose Russia. It never happened. It, but everything never, is that. Never happened. No. But uh, I described in this book also regarding the occult roots of the Great Reset, the link that Klaus Schwab has directly mm-hmm. with China himself. He has an office in Beijing and he has a son who is uh, actually married to a Chinese woman. I mean, so it's... I try to uh, then, yes. for example, in volume two that came out in 2015, I ex- predicted exactly that in 2020 there will be a virus that will lock everybody up uh, and this is what happened. Mm-hmm. It was uh, predicted in mm-hmm. volume two. Uh, and so... I, I, I also give books yeah. that kind of, uh, not prophetically, I would say, but uh, uh, they, they represent a, futures, a future scenario that unfortunately is unfolding, but 
it's a it's a scenario that yeah. is being uh, unfolding for uh, thousands of years and then this is the natural conclusion yeah. of it and that, that's what i'm trying to do here i'm trying to warn people not to be superficial but to analyze these things in the light of a much more uh, complex uh, world and and of yes. course uh, also when you say illuminati you tend to generalize when you say freemason you tend to generalize when you, so i give yeah. the, the more uh, the, the specifics of what these uh, groups really are oh i try yes uh, that, that you do you you go into great detail uh in 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 the the book that i'm reading in the the few that i've had a chance to 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 page through um you know david ike always says if when if if you if you know the journey you'll know the, you know the end game you it, once you know what the end game is you know you you know where they're going everything you can see the totalitarian tiptoe that they do it becomes you know as clear as day you can't it's it becomes obvious and mm -hmm. you know it's like once you realize the agenda it's hard not to see it in everything that, you know, we just had a, we, we, America's sensationalizes in the media. Every time there's a, a shooting, they, they do that because they, they, they need to, they're not, they're, they're not interested in solving the problem. They're interested but in taking the guns. Me. You know, that is, the, that is the end game. This is very important yeah. what you said, because uh, in volume eight of my confession, my latest book, I made a whole chapter to explain this problem and to try to make people realize uh, what they can do. Uh, because uh, here we're talking about uh, killers who, that are often influenced by uh, the society and the culture around them, meaning the music they listen, uh, the films they view, uh, the mm -hmm. mainstream media propaganda they see, they are uh, undoubtedly affected by all this. Uh, even the latest Absolutely. event we saw in Nashville, it's influenced by uh, an yes. external force that is pushing uh, this, uh, between brackets, trans woman to act Absolutely. in a certain way. So uh, the, the, the actual... That's uh, right. What I try to explain in this book, uh, because this uh, latest book, Volume 8, uh, is the first time I also go in my own personal experience as a DJ, a record producer, somebody who has uh, worked for a long time mm. in the entertainment industry, who uh, had um, also my grandmother, who used to work for a long time in the entertainment industry, who introduced me to the works of Alistair Crowley, who introduced me also to what really went on behind the oh, scenes. Wow. Who, uh, my grandmother Felicity Mason in coming was also a famous author, but she used to work with William Barrows, Brian Geis, and with, uh, she introduced me to all the cool people in the 80s, uh, from Peter Gabriel to, you know, to the Pet Shop Boys, to everybody, because yeah. it was like, I was very young, but I had the, the fortune of having a grandmother who... Uh, Mm -hmm. was uh, from that environment. She was also, in, during the war, she met my grandfather. They were both intelligence operative in, in the British intelligence. And she used to actually, they used to work mm -hmm. in an office in New York uh, when America was still mm -hmm. not directly involved with the war. And they used to, she used to, she was an expert in cryptography. All the communications between the British prime minister wow. and the American president they were, went through my grandmother. So you can imagine the level of, Wow, sensitive, that's sensitive material they amazing. were dealing with, but uh, um, I I try to explain in, in in this book the influence that culture can have. Uh, mm. Actually, I talk a lot about these uh, things that happen in the schools, uh, starting from Columbine, going through other events because often they are involving. Mm. I mean, like I said, they are this. There is this cultural influence that you can't deny. If you absolutely, to, uh, if you listen to certain kind of music like those guys in Columbine did, follow a, oh, play, yeah. play certain video games, 
you turn out then to show up like a uh, trench coat mafia and you do what you do. But the That's same right. thing can be said for other... Now, l- lately, we had also another phenomenon which I denounced in my book, this, these rappers even, who, like the guy in, in Boston, who goes on, they, a, on a car rampage, killing people after doing videos, yeah. showing that it is cool to be... You know, a hip hop gangster, one kind or the other. But here it's not about condemning hip hop because that will be, of course, no. superficial. Uh, and, but I, I must say that uh, in my book, I say I'm, I'm, I was rather shocked when last year, though, uh, Newsom made an effort to uh, pass a bill so that no song, you no know, content in these songs and can be criminally, uh, you can't criminally prosecute them in any way. So, you know, make them then uh, not any more uh, legally uh, liable in any way, these rappers uh, who maybe at times uh, really push people towards a certain kind uh, of life. Yeah. Like many also other kind of artists. Well, that so, goes... You know, this is what I try right. to do. I think well, Newsom, that- Newsom is... Uh... Yeah, he's born and bred. I mean, he's a he's a poster child for the new world order. He's a he's a Pelosi. He's I mean, the guy has. I mean, I forget about it. Newsom, he's got aspirations to be the next uh, president. God help us all. He, I mean, he is as uh, you know, quote liberal as 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 it gets. He's I, I can't Absolutely. stand. It's, it's a desperate stooge because when you say Pelosi, you know, you're yeah. talking about somebody who was brought up in Georgetown with the husband, belonged to a certain secret society Mm -hmm. in Georgetown, Mm -hmm. a very influential one. And so we are talking about Mm -hmm. people who are really Jesuit agents. I mean, when when Pelosi was uh, actually condemned by a bishop for uh, for supporting abortion and who didn't want to give him any more communion, she just took the plane and went with her husband to the Vatican the Jesuit Pope gave her the communion. So huh. this is, uh, you know, the way you know, things uh, My work God. out in the world. But uh, then you, you have to understand that here, uh, we, we talk about the Jesuits, and the Jesuits represent definitely a very important part of this conspiracy, but this uh, conspiracy uh, has also another uh, part uh, that is helping out the Jesuits, which is the Sabbatian Frankist. Without the financial help of the Sabbatean Frankists who are heretics from the Jewish world, and the Jesuits will not be able to do what they are doing. Plus, the Jesuits ah. initially, uh, even uh, Ignacio Loyola himself might have been a conversos, and he surrounded himself with conversos. Who are the conversos? You have to understand that in Spain, they were, the, the Jews were heavily persecuted, and so they became... Crypto Jews conversos, so they converted at time out of uh. not get persecuted. Um, and, uh, and then you have to understand also another thing that the Jews are the first victims of this uh, uh, terrible uh, heresy that uh, has been uh, following them now for a few hundred yes. years since Shabbat Zevi, who founded Sab- uh, basically the Sabbatean heretical movement, and then Jacob Frank, uh, who claimed he was his uh, successor and heir, uh, claimed he was his reincarnation, actually, and became his successor and heir. And that's why we call them Sabbatean Frankist. But, you know, uh, wow. then you have the big problem of anti-Semitism, uh, and people uh, use uh, too easily the word Zionism without understanding the connotation because there is a, a good side to Zionism and a bad side of Zionism. We have also the yes. label Zionism, which is uh, the label Zionism is, of course, uh, a product of the Sabbatean Frankist. And this, of course, not because I say it, but because Jewish, uh, Jewish uh, students and, 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 and people who follow uh, mm-hmm. these, uh, these topics have denounced over and over again so I try to do my best to always be very uh, much uh, balanced in my take of things because it's very yeah. easy to be then, uh, you know, do the error that, for example, David Hike did and then being accused of anti-Semitism. I think that David right. uh, these days has uh, uh, 
um, corrected everything by uh, addressing the problem of the Sabbatean Frankist in his books. And I commend him for yes. that. I think he did a great thing. He, f- he finally kind he of... They're uh, going to continue to attack him, but 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 that's all they got. They, they, you know, they, they Everybody who calls him an anti-Semite has not read his books because all you have to do is read his books and it's quite clear that... Uh, he has absolutely no no problem or qualm or, or he speaks at length about how the, the the Jewish people have been victimized. They've been used at every step of the way by yeah. these by these factions, and they and they use they also use the Jewish religion to hide behind because they know it's a great cover. You know that these people. That, I don't believe that they have a, any true loyalty. Or to any nation or religion, it, it, their oath is to themselves and their agenda, their their order, right? Their new world order. That's it. Well, There's nothing, I, I they, they don't you know, go to church. Yeah. Nah, it, it's a bit more complex in the sense. Uh, I think yes, definitely they don't have any allegiance to any country in the world or any, uh, and for that reason, uh, I mean, they don't have uh, any. A true belief in God because they are in reality Satan's legion so they act mm-hmm. to serve the prince of this world and nobody else they are basically uh, trying to accomplish the mission which is in the end to give this world in the hands of uh, you know of this evil power uh, Rudolf Steiner used to call it Ariman we can call it cyber Satan uh, which is now, of course, <laughs> yeah. uh, becoming obvious with the, the AI problem uh, starting to increase, uh, but it's only the beginning. In reality, mm-hmm. cyber Satan is built to support uh, the, the, uh, the rise of the Antichrist. So this is what happened. Mm-hmm. The rise of the Antichrist, uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's something that... Uh, uh, is the product uh, of uh, cyber Satan, and, uh, and yes, I think that uh, we yeah, need to and... understand that. Uh, of course, cyber Satan is not a human being because it's the AI manifesting all over the world, and by 2030 controlling mm-hmm. all the system, this grid. But then you will have a human being which will raise together with it, which will then be identified as the ultimate antichrist amongst the many we had. Right. So, yes, uh, to clear. Uh, up, I just, uh, I just saw a, a special. I, I saw. I was reading something that st- somebody said that actually, BlackRock. Uh, I don't know about Vanguard, but BlackRock is has um, actually been using, uh, you know, an AI, a quantum computer, to dictate uh, its its business dealings for 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 some years now. Somebody, somebody post. I don't know if that's true or not, but it wouldn't surprise me since these people have been worshiping uh, computers and their models since before even algorithms were really prevalent. You know, they've been running yeah, scenarios they, 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 and using yeah, computers. Yeah. I, I explain this in in volume seven, uh, where I explain how uh, Davos and the World Economic Forum. Uh, uh, was very much influenced by the studies that were conducted uh, at MIT, studies, though, that were arranged by the Club of Rome in the early 70s, studies that were initially That's right. one, or two, or three, which gave the, then the, 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 basically the predictions uh, that uh, the for, world... For climate really, change and global so warming. Uh, and yeah. I guess that... Uh, Yes, the, people don't uh, understand that that's where it came from. Yeah, this the so-called sustainability project uh, that brings us mm-hmm. to agenda 2030 was definitely born within uh, that, mm-hmm. uh, that frame. But it wasn't only yes. there that we need to search for the origins because uh, then uh, there is the people who actually inspired this uh, uh, Klaus Schwab to start Davos. In that case, we need to talk about mm. Henry Kissinger, but we also need to talk about uh, a bishop mm-hmm. uh, called the Red Bishop of the Catholic Church at that time called Bishop Camara, 
uh, one of the most uh, important figures in uh, the rise of the so-called liberation theology. Now, liberation theology, when we talk about the Jesuits, we need to talk, we go back to Pierre Teilhard de Cardin, because uh, like Malachi Martin said in his book, the Jesuits, you can't really understand the uh, developments uh, in the company of Jesus, which he was part of, because Malachi Martin was a Jesuit. He became mm -hmm. a Jesuit and then left the Jesuit order after the Second Vatican Council, uh, but uh, to come here to America. But uh, yes, I mean, uh, uh, he said, Pierre Teilhard de Cardin, without understanding Pierre Teilhard de Cardin, you can't really understand the evolution of the Jesuit mm. order in the last uh, few decades. So that's why I said Pierre Teilhard de Cardin, a very important figure. And uh, uh, of course, uh, liberation theology and all that leads us to a communistic Marxist approach around the Christianity, mm -hmm. which... Uh, it's, it's what uh, really Davos has been pushing also. Uh, imagine that yes. in 1974, when they invited basically uh, Bishop uh, Camara to uh, Davos in Switzerland uh, in the middle of the 70s, they, they, they actually suggested Karl Schwab to not have him because he was regarded as too communistic. Uh, as a, uh, he was a Catholic bishop. As you oh, my people. God. <laughs> but he, he went on and he, he actually, when I indicate that also in my book, I say maybe two or three years ago in uh, uh, this uh, initiative he does for the younger people, he was talking, you know, giving one of his interviews where he said, ah, yeah, I'm Klaus Schwab, you know, and he was saying basically yeah. my most important, mo the most important moment, critical moment uh, in Davos and in the development of the World Economic Forum was actually when he invited Bishop Camara and the choice he had to make to go forward in a moment in which communism was definitely not like today. Today, they no. made it acceptable. Socialist, communist, everybody mm -hmm. had to go left, right. But guys, yeah. during the Cold War, anything leftist was... Uh, uh, deemed dangerous uh, and, and it wasn't welcome uh, anywhere in the West. So right. Schwab right. made a choice uh, and definitely he made that choice because uh, he was uh, a Jesuit agent uh, like uh, all, and that Camara was the guy mm -hmm. who organized uh, a secret uh, group under the catacombs uh, in Rome in uh, December 1965 wow. uh, had the meeting known as the Pact of the Catacombs for those who want to know more Volume 7. <laughs> Just so they can... Volume 7, yeah. Yes, they can eventually learn more about this uh, important topic. Because, you know, they all talk about the so, wow, Great that's... Reset and what uh, really is the Great Reset today without really understanding where it comes from. Yes. Is, uh, oh, its roots are deep. Um, the Great Reset is just the latest branding of, of it, but it's... The, it's... <laughs> It's, yeah, I mean, it's, the, its roots are Schwab, far deeper. Yeah. Schwab is a professor, a German professor, a modern heir to Adam Weishaupt, who was also another German professor. They are mm. both uh, very much connected with the Jesuits, and they are both uh, really uh, the, the, the product uh, of, of, unfortunately, a product comes out of Germany because it seems like uh, a lot of bad things come out of Germany, also a lot of good things, but also a lot of yeah. bad things. And the okay. bad things are really bad, and they include, uh, you know, the Illuminati, the Rosicrucian. Socialism, Nazis. <laughs> Socialism, yeah. the Socialism. The Rosicrucian. We have before the that. The Bilderberg kind of, group, right? The Rosicrucians initially were even uh, possibly a good group, but uh, soon after they were influenced uh, and infiltrated by the Jesuits, who understood immediately in uh, 16. Uh, uh, between 1610 and 1615, when the, all the manifests, 1616, with all the various manifestos of the Rosicrucians appeared, the Jesuits immediately understood this is a group we need to infiltrate so we can then manipulate the reform. Mm. Because the Rosicrucians were yes. the symbol of the rose and the cross, is the symbol of Martin Luther, it's at the heart of the Reformation. So they thought, yeah. how are we going to get them back? We're going to get them back in a more subtle way. Then we go back to what I said earlier when I said, you know, the Dominicans were too harsh. 
they needed a more kind of mm. slimy way to infiltrate. And the Jesuits Sneaky, were ideal, yes. very much ideal. In fact, the Jesuits created the fourth vow, which is uh, this uh, dedication uh, to the Pope and nobody else, meaning the first three vows are typical of the religious orders, you know, chastity, poverty, all this stuff, you know? mm. But then after you get to the fourth vow, and the fourth vow is nothing about obedience to Christianity or to Jesus Christ. It's obedience to the Pope and whatever the Pope tells you, you have to do, and that's it. And it can mm. go against Christianity, it doesn't matter, because your fourth vow pushes doesn't you to matter. do it. That's how they became the ideal tool in the hands of the mm. church, the ideal tool. I mean, the, the, the fourth vow yes. of the Jesuit became the way in which, because people don't know about the fourth vow of the Jesuit, because they think, you know, but it is a, a solemn uh, vow. At times, mm -hmm. some religious institutions, you know, uh, have poverty, chastity, and obedience. That's what they have. And at times they can maybe go further, but nobody goes further as, as the society of Jesus. Because the society of Jews, Jesus, in their constitutions, in part seven of their constitution of the Jesuits, discusses the distribution of the members of the vineyard of the Lord. And remember that amongst maybe 40 Jesuits, only one becomes a fourth vow Jesuit. So it's very... That's right. Not like a secret society. It's very, very rare. Dead, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and of course, the, the vow is limited to the priest of this society, which uh, in, in a mm. way... Uh, it's also our superiors in the society of Jesus. Uh, and I saw them uh, often, this uh, fourth vow Jesuits. I remember when I used to hang out at the, at the Knights of the Holy Sepulchre. On the other side, you have the headquarters of the Jesuit, Borgo Santo Spirito. And sometimes I used to see this, this uh, Jesuit priest coming in the afternoon, you know, like secret agents with a little, you know, a little suitcase, yeah. a little thing, I don't know, a little... Mm, uh, were like shady. Very, very shady, very much looking like they didn't want to be there, like they were invisible. They wanted to become... Mm. They, want, they didn't want to be noticed. So they were very right. much like the most ordinary, ordinary priest at the time, not even dressed as a priest. They would just go up. I remember, go, there is an entrance, a Porgo Santo Spirito, you have a guy on the left, uh, like a portier, who then has uh, these cameras and stuff, and he opens you, and you go upstairs. Mm. And you, you know, I remember once I was talking with the portier about something, I don't remember. Huh? And, uh, and and then I saw these two or three sneaky Jesuits, uh, sneaky looking Jesuits arriving, you know, in their briefcases and going up mm -hmm. to the general, you know. This yeah. is uh, basically the reality of, uh, of an order which is, uh, first of all, uh, a uh, tool, uh, a weapon in yes. the hand of the papacy, especially the fourth vow. Uh, then, uh, of course, uh, you have yeah. most of them who only take you, the anything you want. Vows. Yeah. So, so then, you know, when you generalize and you say, ah, oh, the Jesuits, yeah, well, but which Jesuits? It's a you little bit yeah. like when you say right. the Freemasons, but which Freemasons? Because, yeah. you know, you go to your there's, order... There's and millions they, of them here in America. Uh, the ones yeah. here at the local lodges, uh, they are a little more than... <laughs> Those uh, guys are drinking beers, hanging out with their buddies. They're like, listen, my friend John's a Freemason, okay? <laughs> He's a great guy. I'm like, listen, all right, I, I believe you. I, 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 listen, I, I'm, I'm not saying anything is wrong with you and your friends. I, I, I'm like, forget I said anything. I understand that you know Freemasons, and I, I'm sure they're no, good people. Is, you know, is, you listen, I, I, yeah. I've been a Freemason uh, all my life, mostly, you know, since I was yeah. initiated uh, when I was 23. Now I'm 53. So I've, I've been uh, uh, in, an initiate uh, in Freemasonry for 30 years. I mean, mm. this is something that not many people have been. I don't practice yeah. any longer Freemasonry, so I'm kind of like... Uh, right. Because uh, when I came here to the U.S., I went through a few lodges here in California. I understood the kind of connotation they had, the, the fact yeah. that they were very much 
politically leftist inclining, but also they were accepting. Some of them, no, eh? there is some lodges who are more conservative. Yeah. Most of them were actually already branding me because of my association with, uh, you know, with Alex Jones, with other people. They were already seeing, ah, this is real Zagami. No. You know? And, and, and it, 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 I didn't like that. Yeah. And, I, and I didn't like also the fact right. that they, here in California, especially, most of the lodges are infiltrated by the OTO, OTO which is the Ordo Tempi Orientis of Alistair Crowley, that became of Alistair yeah. Crowley, was born out of the Illuminati of Germany and Austria. Then you have uh, infil- mm-hmm. uh, people who have infiltrated from even the Muslim Brotherhood and other groups. So I just didn't feel wow. right, especially when they said that the former a former grandmaster had criticized publicly Donald Trump. I said, well, screw them. I'm not into this. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I wasn't really into one to joining. But of course, I mean, what I saw with my own eyes was this. Uh, and I remember, uh, remember, even my wife is a Freemason because I got her initiated in London, so she knows about these things. But of course, here we're talking mm-hmm. about regular Freemasons, so they accept only men in their lodges. But one That's day, right. we went there for an event that was open to the family also. And I brought mm-hmm. my wife, who they wanted to, uh, they wanted uh, to join the shrine. Uh, no, sorry, the, uh, ah. they're called, the, East, the e- e- Eastern Star. Yeah, Eastern Star, East, Eastern Star. It's, it's an order that is uh, built for the wives of Freemasons. And the, uh, um, yes, I... I basically uh, arrived there at the at the <laughs> entrance of uh, uh, you know where you have uh, the parking place, and the first thing that me and my wife yeah. first saw was this uh, big pickup truck with uh, uh, an upside down pentagram uh, in the image of Baphomet. Oh and wow! I was, I was, this is a black magic satanic symbol. Oh, Why God. are you letting people in with this kind of and then I noticed that in that lodge where they wanted me to join, there were a bunch of young people who were obviously, I don't think, suitable because they were with the wrong values. They were all Satanists. They were all kind of like, in, 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 even, right. if, even if they posed as such, they were doing it maybe because right. they were playing a certain kind of music and they think it's cool. I don't think it's cool at all to have those kind of people uh, within the real, uh, within right. the mission. So that was Crowley. I, Crowley's, you know, his influence is vast. Uh, and, and as uh, I mean, the, okay. I don't understand it, but you know better than anyone how yeah. far his tentacles spread, you know, into Freemasonry. It's crazy. Yes. Yeah. Uh, for, every, for everyone mm-hmm. listening, you know, Alistair Crowley is for, he's pretty well known, you know, but he, he brought in he brought luciferianism and satanism you know into a specific part of freemasonry and it took I, I stronger think, uh, in many well, I, I think it's not him that started though i think uh, what happened was this okay. in 75 uh, we have the arrival of the theosophical society the theosophical society of madame blavatsky ah, became yeah. the playground of the new Satanist and of the occultist mm. worldwide who wanted to, if you think about it, I mean, it was actually Ariosophy and all those things that led to the, the, the murder of millions of Jews uh, originated, uh, uh, originated mm. unfortunately, from Theosophy because uh, it was a Theosophical background that all those people who supported Adolf Hitler at the beginning and inspired them from his time in Austria. Even the symbol of the mm. swastika was uh, something that was used by people who were in the Theosophical Oh, that's society. right, that's right. You had the people like, uh, and I explained this very much in volume of, uh, seven, you have von Liebenfeld, uh, you, you had these people that basically were uh, were all connected to to Madame Blavatsky's uh, ideas, uh, uh, the alien race, yeah. uh, the Atlant- Atlantis. The chan- that she was a channel, right? Mm-hmm. Well, she was a channel, but what was she a channel? She, she was channeling, but what was she channeling, really? Uh, at times, uh, one wonders, really, 
you know this 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 is a very yeah. dangerous uh, a kind of thing you're doing when you're channeling and and what you're channeling yeah now madame Blavatsky, well, look at the look what the influence yeah. yeah yeah her mentor apparently was a guy called max theon now her mentor apparently was also a sabbatean frankist max theon some people mm. you know say maybe she was not uh, mentored by Max Theon, but if you go and check the history of this guy whose uh, uh, name was Louis uh, Maximilian Bimstein, he was a Polish Jewish Kabbalist and occultist who uh, inspired this hermetic brotherhood of Luxor, uh, this uh, cosmic movement, and uh, mm. He, he basically inspired, he died in 1927, he inspired very much also uh, Madame Blavatsky's moves and uh, the, 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 basically without, uh, I think, Theon, uh, I, I don't think there would have been uh, Blavatsky's uh, uh, revelations, let's say, and, and the link with the medical mm. brotherhood of Luxor is also a very important one, because then we have the medical brotherhood of Luxor, and linked, it's also the medical brotherhood of light, which is basically the basis for the the the, the, the very the That's early right. stages of the order of the Orientis, which then manifests with. The, uh, initially with Theodore Royce and this other guy called Karl Kerner, and then later on becomes uh, the, the, the becomes this Academia Masonica that becomes the OTO. But Crowley then is uh, oh, that's right. uh, recognized by these people, contacted because of what he was revealing and because they thought he could be suitable for leading the British section, and that's what happened later on. Then Crowley... Mm started to become very much involved with this uh, uh, German Austrian secret society, but some people think That's that right. he was also involved with intelligence activities. And uh, let's not forget that Theodor Reuss himself was a member also of a British law, London Lodge, which still exists to this day, which is Pilgrim 238, which still is the only lodge in England that talks German. And exists from the times of Queen Victoria. <laughs> wow! And well, the Pilgrim Lodge 238, wow. which I had the opportunity. I mean, my mentor was the worship of master of uh, Pilgrim 238, uh, Julian Rees, back in the days when I was initiated at the Kirby Lodge 2818, and I um, I didn't get initiated in the Pilgrim Lodge simply because my German is not that good. Otherwise, yeah. I would probably join myself. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, I joined. A, a lodge uh, which was uh, equally important uh, and uh, which uh, also had the, some of the same members, including this Julian Rees, uh, who was my mentor. Uh, I think that uh, my experience, though, in Freemasonry has been uh, at times difficult, at times positive, uh, because at least I realized mm -hmm. uh, what was really happening and, and how influential these people really were. And I can tell you that the yeah. majority of Freemasons are not influential at all. No. A lot of them no, I know. generally want to simply study these mystery school traditions. I commend them for, for you know, not wanting to waste their time maybe at a bar or at a sports bar or in, in a pub. Instead, they go to right. a lodge. I mean, that's great. But uh, when it comes to... Sure. To the people who are leading these organizations today, no. The values yeah. also of regular Freemasonry have completely polluted. Uh, Freemasonry uh, was yeah. divided in two factions after the 1870s, the Grand Orient and the United Grand Lodge of England faction. But these days, these two factions and the values they represent are getting uh, not really, they don't really represent different values because it's actually the United Knowledge of England that is going after the values of the Grand Orient of France. I mean, the United Knowledge of England is the one that now accepts trans men, trans women, uh, all kinds of trans. Uh, oh. you know, they don't accept women, but they accept so, women, men who pretend to be women or women who pretend to be men. So, I mean, it's just like 
it's crazy. And then they, so, you, so in other words, oh, yes, they're yeah, merging, yeah. right? Like the, the one is more was more progressive, and that well, I say progressive. What I mean is l less yeah, no, no, and absolutely. Twisted, and the other one, absolutely. yeah, they so were now they're progressive. Yeah, I mean, yeah, because they were always linked to the Jesuits. When instead the United Nations of England was traditionally linked to the Anglican Church, and much and always hold. A mm. little bit, because you have to understand the whole concept of, of intelligence services with the Jesuits was born also out of the necessity of the, you know, the Reformation. But you had also Elizabeth I, who had John D, the first 007, and, and, and of course... John D, that's what? right. Well, who was fighting John D? John D was fighting the Catholic Church. They were fighting, you know, the, 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 that's Spanish, right. the that Spanish was the, kingdom they were, of the world. So they were fighting the Jesuits. That's they right. were fighting basically. <laughs> so the, this is really what happens here. There is a lot of confusion at times, but uh, we can say that the Jesuits mm -hmm. play more than one side, and they always manage to yes. be very successful in, in, in playing mm -hmm. both sides. Yeah, they're very good at that. Any other uh, um, question you might have in mind? That's yeah, so so you know, I'm I would think you're curious about about this uh, being uh, you know um, I've kind of gr I don't want to call myself Catholic anymore, but I was raised Catholic. I'm baptized and I I received all the sacraments and um, you know I, I I'm no longer practicing, but you know I I, I love God. I love Jesus. Um, I I. I comport myself accordingly, but I don't consider myself Catholic anymore because of what I've learned. And, and, but what I'm curious about is the Vatican, you know, was, it seems to me, the more I learn that the Vatican was formed solely as a, as a power structure, that it was never, you know, it's public persona was never truly what it was made for, even from the beginning. It wasn't that it was corrupted. It was that it was it was designed with corruption in mind. And I know that you know the history. Very, go ahead. Yeah. Now, let's understand a little bit what the Vatican is, because otherwise people will have, you know, confused idea of what it really is. I mean, the Vatican uh, came up uh, in Rome uh, after a few hundred years, the, the, the Christians got accepted and became the uh, state religion. There was a period in which, though, they were underground, mm -hmm. with Constantine the Great yeah. and his mother, who was a very influential member of the sect, they uh, manifested this uh, as the state religion, which became also, in a way, the mm -hmm. moment of decline from Ro for Rome that... Uh, eventually will transfer yeah. all the power from the city of Rome to the city of Istanbul, right. which at the time was called Constantinople, because uh, Constantinople from Constantine. So, and that was then led to mm. the period which is the Byzantinium period, you know? But the whole, the first five centuries of, of, of the church were, first of all, to understand what the Christianity really was, because we had those who were really close to Christ, who in a way mm -hmm. didn't really want to deal uh, so much with uh, the, the, the with Rome, uh, there was of course uh, yeah. James, uh, the church uh, of who of James James was said to be the brother of Jesus. Already, that uh, it's uh, kind of an uncomfortable position mm. when you know you're saying uh, the brother of <laughs> Jesus. Okay, fine, but. Yeah. Uh, but isn't Mary a yeah. virgin? <laughs> so, you know, and already right. you create right. a problem right. there. Then you right. have the destruction of the temple that succeeded the Jesus, the destruction of the temple that Jesus himself had announced. So that was another problem. Top. Then we had Paul mm. Christianity because Paul never really met, as at least it said, he never met in person Jesus. Uh, though right. there is some skeptics who say 
Jesus, he met Jesus because maybe Jesus wasn't really crucified. And there is so a whole school of thought that, uh, but in reality, though, the first real Christian church was, uh, the foundations were laid down for what is now known as the Coptic church in Egypt. That is the most primitive form the of Coptic, Christianity. The Coptic, that's right. Still, yeah. To this day, the Coptics don't really... Yeah held in high esteem the Vatican, but the Vatican tries to corrupt them and to, to make them join their club every day of the year. I mean, I was guested right. for, uh, for a brief period of time in Cairo by the Budrus Kali family, which is the patrons of the Coptic church, and they were receiving gifts from the mm. Vatican every week. Like, you know, they wanted to wow. try to get them, you know, close, but they didn't care because yeah. they know very well the corruption that the Vatican has. So yeah. I was uh, uh, in Egypt and I discovered, of course, many things about uh, Jesus and uh, the history of Jesus. And mm -hmm. at times these things, uh, you know, they're not really the, the, the same information we get over uh, after all these uh, uh, no. You know, there, there was, of course, the Council of Constantinople, there was and, the Council of Nicaea. Yeah. No, no, there was the Council of Nicaea, the Council of Constantinople, there were the translation, but all this, everything was decided by councils where at times they right. fought for ideas. You know, For example, after the 5th century, you couldn't uh, believe anymore in reincarnation. 5th, 6th century, after Christ, the reincarnation subject was banned by the Christian church. And that right. was one thing that went out of the window, but people like Origen and the fathers of the church believed in. So how are you going to... Mm -hmm. So there is a period in which Christianity evolves, evolves, and uh, in Rome, Peter, of course, we know what kind of disciple yeah. was Peter. I mean, he was... Yeah. He was the he rock. Had good he was... elements and bad But he was, you know, a rock mm -hmm. on which I lay the foundation of my church, but he was also the guy... Who, uh, who basically uh, betrayed, in a way, Jesus uh, before uh, the, you know, he himself said, you will renegade you know, my name. You will basically, in a way, you That's will right. uh, try to... And he wanted to hit Judas. Did he want to hit he, Judas with a rock? Who <laughs> was one of them there, I think. And <laughs> Jesus was like, no, put that down. <laughs> yeah, no, no. But the, the thing is that in the end... Peter went to Rome, went to Rome, and he had to fight himself against people like, you know, the influence of people like Simon Magus, for example, very influential back then. Mm. People who were claiming they had the same powers of Jesus, and they were very much uh, in that frame, mm. you know, in that political situation in Rome, they yes. could have been used against Peter. Uh, Peter, in, in any way, the laid the foundation of this sect that uh, strived for, but for some centuries, yeah. practice in the underground. I mean, you just go to the catacombs in Rome and you see the traces of this church, mm -hmm. which practiced their cult underground for many centuries. Yes. Uh, now, things are very different, but the Vatican then rise from the, uh, from, you know, they were underground and they rise above, but when they rise above, they became a state institution and they became one with the, the empire. And so also the power of the emperor yeah. in, in one way or the other was transferred to the pontifex, this figure. The pontifex, mm. it's, it's a figure that existed in ancient Rome even before the papacy, the Catholic, uh, yeah. the Christian papacy, the, the pontifex figure. But the pontifex figure is basically um, the, 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 the figure, the pontifex maximus of Rome is a figure... The head, the head, the head honcho, some, right? Yeah, and that it's somehow ah. the elements of the emperor... And the pharaoh. Almost like because, a Caesar. Let's not forget. Yeah. Yeah, because after Caesar, uh, you have the son of Caesar with Cleopatra. In theory, should have uh, unified the East and the West in oh. one tradition, and it would have been unprecedented. So it was a period of great turmoil. We have these traditions that kind of uh, constitute the basis of, uh, of the papacy, 
And the papacy is not simply a Christian papacy. It's also taking what came before and covering it up and yes. making it their own. Rebranding it. Uh, I'm talking yes, about the yeah. cult. Rebranding it. I'm talking about the cult of Mitras. I'm talking about uh, many other cults. The Isis cult, which I mentioned earlier, yes. when it came down to the Jesuits, the rebranding of what the Black Mary, the Isis cult uh, under the Black Mary. Then we right. have Aphrodite. We have many other cults that were simply picked up and transformed. And when they didn't find a suitable option, they were rebranded as a saint. The suddenly had a miracle mm. in the place where that pagan cult was worshipping for hundreds of years. Whoa. Wow. And they took over the show, and everybody will then go and visit that wow. same exact place they visited for hundreds of years as mm -hmm. a pagan cult, but this time maybe they were worshipping a saint. <laughs> you know, because right. that saint had a, you know, wow. had an illumination right in the right. same place. I'm not saying yeah. that, but I think the problem here is that uh, Christianity in its purest form was probably known by the community that lived with him and immediately after him with James. But Christianity, yes. the Pauline Christianity, yeah. and what became later, well... <sighs> We have to admit that there is a lot of things yeah. that uh, have been made, yes. uh, you know, you know, and, and, and we don't necessarily have to believe them. But most Christians today, for example, when you talk about reincarnation, they will immediately tell you, you are an heretic, you are a Satanist, you are this and you are that. Uh, yeah, hey, <laughs> calm down. Yeah. Because the fathers of the church say something yeah. different. This is a... a you know, so here That's we're right. talking about uh, a decision that was made by dragging the Pope, uh, literally, uh, they dragged him, they picked him up, he was anchoring to the, in, in Istanbul, in Constantinople, and picking him up and throwing him on the ground and then drash, you know, I mean, there was some violence involved to make him then believe, right. The, right. to make them part the diversion that they didn't have to believe in reincarnation. So, I mean, I don't know. I mean, there is many other things than, you know, who is Jesus, who yeah. is Mary, and many other things that what? we will never be sure yeah. until we have uh, an open day at the archives of the yes. Vatican. Then in that case, maybe we can have Transparency. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah. 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 But if we have to um, yeah, no, but if I have to believe in all the things that the Vatican tells me, and then the Protestants didn't really protest those elements. The Protestants did some good things. Yeah. I mean, they took away all that pagan saints paraphernalia that was kind of right. obfuscating Jesus and God. But having said that, mm -hmm. they didn't really put into discussion the decisions that were done in the various uh, councils. They didn't... Uh, Right. Go back and evaluate the figure of, uh, of James, uh, uh, brother of Jesus, uh, who, who, who still uh, we don't really know much about. So maybe, you know, yeah. if Martin Luther or Calvin or, or, or King James with his Bible approve, I mean, people think, that Leo, I use the King James Bible. You should use it too. Well, let me tell those people <laughs> that my ancestor was the no, no. You just go on the internet, you can see it. My ancestor was the tutor of King James, his tutor. No so, kidding. Just so you know. Wow. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm, I'm talking, you know, <laughs> but the, 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 then when it comes to, I think, uh, the closer and real Christian tradition is, of course, mm -hmm. then also the Jewish tradition, because nobody can deny yes. that Jesus was a rabbi, that Jesus was himself a member of That's uh, right. a religion that uh, you know still exists to this day. Now, yes. the brother of Jesus was stoned, martyred 62 or 69 years, uh, stoned to death by the Pharisees on order of a high priest. Wow. Just to give you an idea of what the first Christians had to go through. But... Uh, wow. Um, 
I mean, uh, Clement of Alexandria said that James, uh, whom the people called the just, because he was an outstanding figure. I mean, and, and, and what does mm. the Catholic Church do? They place him on the side and they give much more importance to Paul, the a guy who in theory never met yeah. Jesus. Right. So, Right. Well, that because the, you had to take a, you had to take away incarnation because it, that but they don't want people thinking they got another chance at it. That's a fear. That's a pa- fear power structure, right? They the the role of women and everything was. I I think the corruption well, I mean, came in the really attempt even... to control. Yeah, also, the, you know, I, also when it comes down to the women, the fact that we all know that uh, the actual rule uh, that the Pope himself now wants to actually yeah. discuss uh, uh, later, which is basically the fact that, that a priest can marry or not, is something that sprang up only a thousand years ago and it was out of necessity because they didn't want uh, the inheritance to, 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 to know, to, to in a way... That's right. Uh, uh, it was the, you know, it was all property of the church, and they didn't want it to go back to some private right. guy with the son of the even the reasons the for putting the rule in place. Were... <laughs> yeah, yeah. But then they started <laughs> with the hypocrisy. You know, then the hypocrisy. The, the, the son of the priest will become a flash and will then reappear, becoming maybe this or this other figure. Yeah. Will come a flash. The son of a bishop or a pope will. Still have relevance, but they will not be they didn't want the son of the you know the people. They, they, they live so the, they made it a religious a lot of edict. Yeah, and yes. and and then another a lot. thing is that they created hypocrisy, they created the problems, and then in the end they helped the church becoming the perverse church of today. Because now the church of today is a That's church right. in, a bunch, the, in the hands of a bunch of people because they claim that they are, you know, they are basically accusing everybody uh, sodomy, homosexuals are condemned uh, officially by the Catholic Church, and then 80% of the Catholic Church is homosexual, and a large part is even, is even pedophile. <laughs> so, I mean, that is something that really uh, is it's a monstrosity yes. in the eyes of God. So we, we, we are yes. here with all these, uh, these compromises, these... Uh, uh, um, lies and stuff that in the end have forged uh, what uh, the, the church of today, which is not a church that is a healthy church. It's a church... No. And then we have, of course, all the evangelicals, all the things eh, that now are all gathering <laughs> thanks to the Jesuits under one world religion banner. Even the Mormons mm. have made a deal with the Vatican so they could build their own Later, the Saints Church in Rome. So the they Church all of kind of got Saints. together. Yep. Yeah, yeah the, Church of the Saints, the Mormons have made a deal with the wow. Vatican. That's it. I mean, wow. there is no opposition. There is no. The, the Protestant, the, the, the Pope says, oh, Martin Luther was a great guy and everything is fine. And that's it. I mean, it's, it's all kind of. And yeah. trust me, if Protestants. What do you... At the time of when the Jesuits came into action against the reform, had probably a more capable enemy, culturally speaking, I'm not saying militarily, yeah. because the military, you know, the right. Church of England was formed. But I'm, I'm talking about if they had the knowledge that unfortunately was hidden, mm. but for the church, that, that at that time was the knowledge in the West. They yes. had the knowledge. They were the ones that had the university, the school. They were writing the books. Mm-hmm. The books weren't even into print, if not thanks to them, first mm. in, in Germany and then That's in right. Italy, the first two books, thanks to these monks, German monks that published these books. I mean, but before... so. Leo, if I prescribe what, what's some, happening with... And I say to you... Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, Please. go ahead. No, no, uh, no. I, was no, gonna, no, I, no, I no, wanted no, to no, ask, no, you know... No, okay. Uh, so tell me, 
because I've seen over the last three years, you know, I've seen the, you know, we, we saw the churches shut down during the quote pandemic. Um, and, and we saw, yeah. you know, people and, and, and attendance, particularly here in America was already waning and now it, it's fallen off and it's never recouped. And I see churches closed and I'm one, I, I mean, I, the church has made a mess of itself in more ways than one. And they've created, you know, a, a disaster be, between the, the pedophilia exposure and ju just the, the nonstop, um, the bad press, you know, and the business deals, it's, it's, you know, much better than I do. They're, they're, they seem to be in trouble. And, and what I saw from the government was, uh, you know, this, oh, they're, this they're carrying away trouble. of the, the, the Yeah. So, but if you think about it, that they are just following their own path, which is to uh, put uh, science in front of faith. That's it. Uh, science, uh, reason in front of faith because faith is being destroyed after the second Vatican Council the Catholic Church is no longer what it used to be I admire those traditionalists those say the vacantists those uh, uh, people who don't believe in the church after the second Vatican Council because I think that everything that came after the second Vatican Council is contrary to the tenets of the original Catholic Church whatever those tenets yeah. might have been the last remains of Christianity was diluted after the Second Vatican Council and the mm. fact that they also chose to, um, re, uh, to to basically in the long run even dismiss and refute the Latin Mass which was at the center no? the Tridentine Mass was mm. substituted okay but still, now the Pope is actually going That's after right. anybody that wants to have a Latin Mass almost persecuting them for the use of wow. a simple Latin Mass so one wonders what is happening and what is happening is described very well in volume 6.66 of my confessions mm. um, and in, in my other books in, when I, in which I describe the takeover of what happened during the Second Vatican Council, even in Volume 8, uh, when it comes, mm. which is, Volume 8 is based on entertainment, but even the entertainment was changed after the Second Vatican Council. Yeah. Entertainment mm. became, uh, I mean, they even had Bob Dylan in front of John Paul II performing or uh, people <laughs> like that. This, this would have been unimaginable before. It became like, uh, uh, yeah. let's open the doors to Satan. Let's do, mm -hmm. let's open the doors to everything that uh, we used yeah. to condemn because now we are no longer condemning it. And, 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 and of course, that will include also groups like uh, that might seem innocent, like the Beatles. But then when we see them putting on the cover of uh, Sgt. Pepper Only Heart, uh, Alistair Crowley, we, do, we know that they're not so innocent. So the Vatican has, right. had succeeded in isolating itself a little bit from this decline until after this, the, the Second World War, the Freemasonry took over mm -hmm. the, the Vatican and the, the same form yeah. of Freemasonry, which was the progressive French form of Freemasonry, was behind the Second Vatican Council. They were capable of mm. even initiating a pope Pope Roncalli was initiated wow. by the French Freemasons. And then later on, Pope Montini was also another Freemason. So, I mean, they, they actually had, they started having Freemasons in the office, wow. which is regarded as the most holy of holies, which is the Vatican, uh, the Petrin Ministry. That nowadays, of course, uh, is... Uh, kind of like becoming more of a secular office, almost uh, more um, yeah. secular, more uh, uh, normalized, because uh, now we will see even yeah. this Pope probably soon resigning, just like the other one, just like any other job. That what, was... What, why are they resigning? Oh, just because just he's... Yeah. To eliminate that sacrality of, uh, uh, you know, the uh, Pope's sacrality from the Second Vatican Council was 
gradually eliminated. No more crowns, no more mm. uh, uh, no more popes that will live until the last day of their lives doing popey business because that will, of course, like, identify them mm. with a holy man and just holding a holy office. Not they're not holy. Come and go. Man. More like a more like a president or a prime minister. Yeah. Yeah. Which destroys the the very yeah. nature of it, of this mm. uh, because the nature of I mean, it's uh, like uh, when Jesus uh, gave uh, Peter, you know, on you I build my church, not that Peter builds his church, and when he's uh, eighty four or eighty six or eighty nine, he says, okay. I'm gonna go and retire. <laughs> he didn't. I don't think right. this no. will be even imaginable for the first Christian. You know? So it, it, My it God. Is, these days no. they are operating also like the various Masonic rites that have also election and Masonic bodies election for their grand masters. There is only mm-hmm. one Masonic rite which uh, instead is ad vitam, and that is the grand hierophant of the Memphis and Mizraim, which uh, within the Masonic rite is considered mm. the regular, at least uh, here in America. Right. So where did the black, you know, I get so many questions on my, on my videos and people are like, oh, do, do a video about the black Pope. And when, you know, and I'm like, I gotta, I have to find, I don't know enough to do a, a video, you know, when did when did quote the black pope come to be, and and what is that? What does that mean? You know, what what separates him from a normal? Well, uh, pope? the first black <laughs> okay, the first black pope was uh, Ignacio Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits. He Jesuits he founded the order and and, and thereby was elected as the first Jesuit general. And uh, the fact that they were uh, called generals already gave the idea that this was a military mm. order more than a religious one. <laughs> But then, on top of that, in Rome, the people of Rome saw this power and said, wow, this Pope who dresses up all in black actually is more powerful than the one mm. that is over there dressing all in white. I mean, he's a Pope. Uh, he's like a Pope. <laughs> so the Romans nicknamed wow. the head of the Jesuit the Black Pope. Though, having said that, ah, the see. next okay. Pope might actually be a Black Pope in itself, because it might actually be from wow. Africa, but that is uh, something different. Wow, so this is where it comes from. It, it's more That'll like, first. <laughs> it's more like, uh, yeah, no, that would be definitely the first. But it, the fact that they refer to uh, as the Black Pope, to the head of the Jesuits, and still they refer to him like that, even within the Jesuit order, because it became a tradition. Uh, it's uh, it's actually nowadays right. we have Father Souza who is from South America, like Pope Francis, and he is the current Jesuit general. After uh, his predecessor, mm. Adolf Nicola, uh, resigned, and the one before him also resigned. Kornbach. Now, this was the first time in history that even a Jesuit general resigned, but it kind of led the way to the resignation of Pope Benedict the Sixteenth. So the first one to resign was actually Kovenbach, in, uh, and it was unprecedented. Then we had the unprecedented move of another Jesuit general resigning, and and now we have the. F- so at one point there were two living Jesuit generals. This didn't happen when before Kovenbach died. Actually, there were three at one point. I think uh, when this was nominated, and I'm not sure when Sosa Arturo Sosa was nominated. But in any case. It was an unprecedented situation because the Jesuits lead the way and they took control of the church only once in their history because before then they never wanted to have the patron ministry and become popes. They became cardinals, but they never... It was contrary to their... to their ideology to their program to their mission because when they take the fourth bow they give themselves completely in the hands of the pope so how can they at that point become them popes <laughs> who are they gonna give themselves to <laughs> you know yeah it didn't really function in oh the yeah so I, I hope that this has clarified this point for your viewers yes it, yes it definitely clarifies a lot for me uh, and for, for my viewers, I'm sure. 
Leo, you are a, an incredible wealth of information, my friend. Uh, I, I could talk to you for hours, but I know that we're, we're running low on time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read at least three, four more of your books. And, and after I do that and I have some very specific questions, I'm going to invite you back on again because this has been absolutely incredible. Uh, but I want, I want to delve more into your work and have you back on again because it's just so much information. It's amazing. I'm so grateful for your time. Well, uh, I'm grateful for being on with uh, people who are really interested uh, in these topics and also in my work. So for me, it's a pleasure. And uh, uh, call me anytime, uh, especially when we will be discussing my books. That would be a pleasure. So I hope that yes. uh, this show can be an introduction as the amount of work that we could discuss is infinite. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes. People uh, can realize that simply by going on my books, uh, reading my books. I mean, we're talking about each book being three, four, five, six hundred, seven hundred pages. I did eight volumes plus mm -hmm. another two other. I mean, it's an and all this is because when you are talking about the Illuminati, you're not talking about only the Illuminati of Adam Vesha, but about all those mystery schools of old that then we refer commonly, and also yes. those, those secret societies we commonly refer to as the Illuminati, and, and, and everything mm -hmm. needs to be explained in an academic fashion, because this way we avoid any debunking, because they can't be debunking if your sources are credible, and they are That's right. laid seriously in your book. Every time, you know, like in my latest book here, it's over almost 700 pages. Then you go at the end and you have several pages only of all the citations, every single one of them. Right. And you will see also the, 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 the amount of work is, is put on in, in, in really bringing a product that is impossible to the bank. Because my aim is, you know, yes. to go in front of this asshole who, who unfortunately control our universities and say, okay, do you mm -hmm. have anything to say about this? Please, please do. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and and I it's love like, it. because I understood yeah. this from the beginning of my work. You see, when I started my Illuminati Confessions in 2006 on the internet, it was difficult for me because I had to always base all my work on one or two pages. So the span of attention of a reader on the internet is a few lines. Yeah. When I started to publish my books in Japan and then later in Italy, I immediately understood that it was very important to make my sources and my citations very clear. Otherwise, I would also receive mm -hmm. criticism, you know, from the enemy they oh would, yeah, you know, say, oh no, but he's not reliable. He's, you know, he, who, who is, you know, they will, they will say right. like, uh, uh, Leo Zagami has nothing supporting what he's saying. No, and that's why I then publish right. books with photos, documents, citations. I say this is it. Boom. Now, in front of history, judge. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I might have a different point of view, but what I'm relaying to you. Right. It's exactly from sources which you yourself recognize, because most of my sources are academic within the, the, the realm of the secret mm -hmm. society or from journalists, from even the mainstream. I don't use uh, sources that might be debatable. Ah, oh, no, this guy is a conspiracy or this guy. Right. Or I, I wanted to bring the conspiracy world to the next level because I thought David Hyde did an excellent job since the 90s. But then there needed to be something right. more because he was kind of like not really uh, approaching certain things because, of course, he didn't have uh, a personal experience like yeah. I had. And right. so he was keeping himself, he was discussing everything from an external point of view, no? And at times, right. uh, this uh, uh, also he had to trust sources which I personally was a bit mm -hmm. doubtful of, you know, some some of the sources. That, but yes. I rely only on myself. So I know what I'm saying. I don't have to rely on it. And my sources eventually came from the realm of the secret societies, which I 
frequented. So I hope uh, that is yes. uh, enough to make the difference and to bring uh, something a little bit more in depth. And, and so I really praise and I difference. think that uh, yes. David Eck has done an excellent job in launching this movement, just like before yeah. him, Jordan Maxwell, though. Jordan was a mm-hmm. friend of mine, the late Jordan Maxwell. And uh, in fact, uh, one the last time I was able to see him, I brought him a copy of my book where I actually talk about him and I say how important he was for our movement, yeah. for those who are in search of the truth. And uh, But uh, there is yes. definitely, I mean, Jordan was uh, very knowledgeable, just as David, uh, just as other mm-hmm. people in this uh, so-called yes. truth movement, if you want to call it still truth movement. Uh, yeah. Like even Alex himself. But uh, we're all doing our own thing. Yes. And I think that uh, my own... Um, my own contribution has been bringing the discussion to a level that is a little bit higher so that the enemy feels like, okay, absolutely. here I'm not going to be able <laughs> to pull out the usual bush with these people because they're way too smart for me. So uh, th- that is uh, yeah. the feel that, uh, that uh, people who read my books uh, need to get, that they're getting, of course, uh, the inner workings, and then that they can go in front of the person, the university school professor, mm-hmm. the teacher, and or you know the relative who likes to, you know, the their libtard relative or whatever, Debunk. and they say no. But, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, no, sorry, that that's not that's that's not how it I, is. I, Thank you so much for having me on, and God bless you guys. And we speak thank soon. you so much, Leo. I'll, I'll be in touch. Thank you so much. You take care.